I'd like to welcome everyone um, to our panel on human rights. Um, this is a really great occasion. I'm very, very impressed by the audience and by the speakers. Uh, there's lots of people in the audience who are expert in this field, so I think we'll be counting on you to weigh in. And of course, this is really a first for SIPA, and I want to acknowledge the incredible work done by Dean Jano and uh, Benjamin Dean. I guess I won't introduce the panel because you've all got the program, but uh, some of you have traveled from far and wide to come here, um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So I think we'll just start with a sort of ground rule kind of question, which is what exactly do we mean by human rights online, and who at this point is enforcing them? Because I think that's obviously a very worrying and scary uh, subject for many people, fenced on that research showing how worried people are about surveillance. Uh, but there's other kinds of human rights online. So perhaps, Marietta, you could just talk a little bit about what, what, what you see is happening there. OK, fantastic. Thank you so much. I also um, very much appreciate the opportunity of bringing people that think about governance and global issues together with people that think about technology <clears throat> and um, uh, have us work out some of these very big challenges. I don't think it happens often enough. And I think it's great that Columbia University uh, and the SIPA school took that initiative. Um, I think in the discussions that we've heard today, we should also be careful that it doesn't stay too much in an abstract uh, level of discussion. So I wanted to just share a few thoughts about how the technological developments and political developments are already influencing each other with or without multi-stakeholder procedures, with or without global norms. Uh, and I've just thought I would share a few examples of um, how human rights uh, are impacted by that. Uh, and especially how what is and is not acceptable, uh, what is and is not legal, is increasingly determined by private actors. Uh, and I'm worried about that development and I think we should pay more attention to it. So generally speaking, in, in global relations, if I look at um, all kinds of fights about blasphemy laws and other um, um, discussions about human rights uh, in the UN and other international fora, the universality of human rights is under great pressure. Um, the EU and the US and other democracies of the world work together still successfully to fight back uh, against um, cultural relativism and other challenges to the universality of human rights, but I think it's important to see it in that context. So besides the pressure on universality, uh, we see a huge increase in the role that private companies play in our societies, especially when it comes to the internet, and governments depending on it increasingly and citizens depending on it increasingly as well. And so, for example, just a few um, things I picked up from the news last week. Uh, Ukrainians have approached Facebook to ask if they could take down sites that are spreading misinformation that are coming from Russia. Now, the fact that this is a serious problem, nobody will contest. The EU is looking at ways in which this can be addressed. But who is to say what is propaganda? I think is a very important question. And how should Facebook act when the Russians request takedown of information and accounts of Ukrainians or Europeans or Americans or human rights organizations? Um, who is supposed to judge what is illegal or what is undesirable? And I want to point to the fact that there is often a slippery slope from what is illegal, which is tested by a judge or another appropriate authority against a law, or what is considered uh, inappropriate. In France, um, we've seen the adoption of new anti-terrorism laws that place black boxes uh, at the internet service providers that will filter information to assess who is visiting dangerous websites. But these black boxes um, are not transparent in terms of what they do exactly. Um, and so regardless of whether that's appropriate in a democracy, um, what we've often seen is that there is a slippery slope that goes from internet service providers being asked to look at what is anti-terrorism material or what would amount to child pornography or other criminal um, content, or to play a part in intellectual property rights enforcement by blocking or limiting access to sites. Uh, and we also know that a lot of social media and other websites have the ability for users to report what is spam or what is inappropriate content. And if that is used systematically, it's very easy to block out voices. 
because accounts do get taken down with a certain number of reports, and um, uh, I think that that is something else to look for. So intermediary liability is a huge issue, I think, here. Uh, similarly, we have standards that are binding in the European Union when it comes to lawful intercept capabilities in telecoms uh, networks. It is the required ability for police and law enforcement to have access to the networks to place a tap when there is a criminal investigation, for example. And although that is all within our law, we see that international trade in these systems is done with the same standards, and these systems are being used in the context without the rule of law protecting people against abuse by either states or companies. And the trade in, in surveillance technologies is of a similar nature, where we see unregulated markets uh, of technologies that can be bought by anyone, whether it's a criminal organization or a, a state with whom we don't have good relations or a state of which we know that the authorities are keen to um, silence voices in their societies. So I think it's essential that we look at the global context and that we look at the role that pr private companies play and that we have to acknowledge that there is a huge lack of oversight and that there is a slippery slope that takes us from illegal and procedures that are grounded in the rule of law to a very vague gray area uh, where it's companies or users uh, or uh, others that very easily can use the big role that these private actors play uh, and that they effectively set norms. Uh, last example I'll mention that I learned through uh, researchers that are working on this is that there are effective sort of sweatshops, modern day sweatshops with uh, all kinds of um, uh, content being selected in low wage countries uh, on the basis of whether it's, it fits the terms of use of social media companies. So for example the Facebooks or other social media of this uh, world will have people in Bangladesh looking at whether uh, beheadings violate the terms of use, pictures of breastfeeding are appropriate or not, whether there's uh, a disproportionate amount of nudity in a picture, um, et cetera, et cetera. And although you know, pictures of beheadings may not be as controversial, uh, breastfeeding, for example, is apparently much more sensitive in this country than it is in the European Union. So even between uh, countries where we think that freedom is, is of the highest standards, there can be a very different assessment of what is appropriate and what isn't. And we have to really ask ourselves whether we would like uh, people that are paid a couple of dollars a day uh, uh, that are watching these pictures day in and day out are the best suited to assess what you and I see uh, or don't see. And I think that with the increased use of technologies, with the increased global impact that it has, with the growing role of private actors and with the lack of legislation, we should not only look at issues around multi-stakeholderism and internet governance, but especially look at the services that go over the internet and how we preserve the values and the principles that I hope we cherish, of which human rights are at least uh, top of my list. So it sounds like some of the human rights, some of what you consider to be human rights online are very similar to human rights offline, which is the free freedom to visit. It's almost like assembly, right? To visit websites without necessarily being surveilled and to also have freedom of expression as well, right? As well as labor standards. Well, I think access to information is very important yeah. and increasingly important when we see commercial companies making selections to information that are impossible to assess because the algorithms are not known. Mm -hmm. um, so access to information is one thing. I mean, you have blatant censorship, of course, of a lot of information in many countries, whether it's mm -hmm. in China or in Turkey or mm -hmm. in other countries where information is simply uh, already pre-selected by uh, governments or, or law enforcement authorities. But just simply access to information and who gets to select what information is relevant and available is a very important question and the role that private actors play there is huge. Um, freedom of expression, of course, freedom of assembly online, press freedom uh, are all very, very important. Um, and we haven't even talked about net neutrality, but that's also right. an area where these principles and the technology uh, really <laughs> touch each other. Coincide. That's right. This fits nicely on, yes, with the work that you're doing at the Columbia Freedom of Expression Initiative that you're directing. Can you speak a little bit to this? And yes. Some extraterritorial obligations. I know you just got back from Europe. So. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm uh, responsible for a new initiative at uh, Columbia University, which looks at the formation of global norms with regard to expression and information. And of course, um, uh, internet and uh, the new technology is one of the major um, 
major focus of our, of our work. We're particularly looking at the role of courts, tribunals, judges, and juries uh, in um, producing norms, domesticating norms, contributing to norm setting at a, uh, at a global level. But I, I won't talk, um, I, I may go back to it a little bit. I, I wanted to also um, link, um, uh, to respond to your question, Anya, about mm -hmm. the uh, human rights and, and its enforcement in, in the online world. Uh, first of all, with regard to, um, to human rights uh, and what do we mean by human rights online, of course we ought to mean in theory that they are the same mm -hmm. online and, and offline. Uh, on the other hand, as, as everyone in this room probably knows and beyond that room, internet has brought so much challenges in terms of um, understanding of key concepts and as well as uh, behaviors mm. that some of our well-entrenched understanding of what constitutes expression, what constitutes privacy, what constitutes uh, access to information or indeed transparency, all of those have been quite uh, challenged by, by what uh, internet and the new technology um, has offered. So I, I think it is fair to say that in theory we, we ought to always go back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the uh, International Covenant, uh, and, and a range of other regional instruments. Um, in practice it has proven to be a little bit challenging, particularly over rights that have been directly uh, challenged by internet. So it's expression, access to information, and privacy in, in particular. Um, and, and I guess the, 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 the one thing I could uh, highlight is to imagine having to rewrite the UDHR, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was written in 1948. Mm -hmm. Imagine having to write it now, to draft it now, to reach global consensus on, on, on all the various articles. And I, I think it is fair to say that it will be a near impossible exercise. Uh, not only because um, of different understanding of some of those key principles, but 1948 was a very specific period in global history. There had been a war, there was winners, there were losers, uh, you know, nothing that, um, th there was basically one, one kind of dominating system. The emerging communist system was not yet very strongly there. So the, the landscape was actually quite conducive to uh, the adoption of some very important um, principles. Right now we have, you know, uh, some will call that a messy multipolar system, but definitely something that is very different from 1948. And most importantly, it's not just governments that have a say uh, on what are human rights. So it's the, the, the private companies, the corporate actors are very important in defining it. So are the users. So are the engineers um, and, and all those people who for the last 30 years have actually built uh, internet and have a, a vested interest in keeping the global vision uh, of the 70s still alive in spite of the complete transformation of, um, of the landscape. So that's, uh, make it, that makes for a very complicated um, environment as far as human rights is concerned. The enforcement of human rights, notwithstanding the fact that probably nobody really agrees on what they are online, mm -hmm. the enforcement is also very challenging. What do we mean by enforcement? In, in usual, usual, we mean protection, who is responsible for the protection of those rights, and who is going to be held accountable if and how, if those rights are, not being, are being violated. So uh, the protection framework is confused and confusing. You know, there are not only governments, uh, the government of your own jurisdiction um, is usually primarily a concern with the protection of your human rights. But here we are in, an, in a world where my right to expression, my right to information, my right to privacy may actually be violated by a government with whom I have no contact whatsoever. Uh, it could be Chinese, it could be American, it's usually one of those two and maybe a, a few others mm -hmm. uh, for a variety of reasons that I think uh, Edward Snowden has as well highlighted when he uh, put forward the, the revelation that he did. Um, so the, um, the, who is responsible for the protection of those rights is, um, is uh, a big question. And who is to be held accountable if those rights are violated is another 
uh, big questions. Extraterritorial obligations is a very technical aspect of that, but I think it's quite fundamental to the internet world. The key question is who, um, how far does the human rights obligation of a government, how far does it go? Does it apply only to their citizens within their territory? Does it apply to their citizens outside their national territory? Does it apply to non-citizens, but some, somehow non-citizens with, with whom the government has some kind of relationship, a prison, for instance, being a stating point? Um, so all of those questions are very much at, uh, debated at the moment, or uh, the object of, of much um, um, controversies, I will say. Um, the, the American uh, position is that the, um, their, their extraterritorial obligations uh, does not apply with respect to individuals under their jurisdiction but outside the territory. So what it means is basically that all the privacy rights of European, Asian or African citizens that may be impacted by the metadata a practice of the NSA and others uh, fall outside what the US considered to be its human rights obligations under uh, the ICCPR. It's far more complex. I'm just summarizing mm -hmm. very, very uh, abruptly. Um, this is a position that is not new, by the way. They've had that position. The US has had this position very consistently, so it's not linked to the new technologies. It's just continued to be applied in spite of the fact that the, um, the, the norms, the customary norms that has emerged with regard to ex extraterritorial obligations is actually that uh, governments have human rights obligations on uh, people that reside outside their jurisdictions provided there is some kind of effective control over them. Um, that's one of the dominant interpretation at least. Two development last year, I think. Sorry, can I just, I want to clarify, yeah. I'm not a lawyer, so I just want to make sure I really understand. So a U.S. company that commits a human rights violation not overseas. Companies. No, that's what I'm asking. Would, it, that would be illegal. But if it's a technology company that somehow has access to data or the email of someone overseas is not responsible? So would there be a difference between, okay. say, so, you know, Chevron in Burma and Google in China? Is that... So the, the clarify? yeah, I, I'm going to clarify. The, um, we, first of all, one, one point to make is that the U.S. position may not always be completely um, systematic, shall mm -hmm. we say. So, you know, this, uh, just the speaker before uh, this morning, um, just before our session, was talking about the fact that there seems to be a fairly big margin of appreciation on the part of the United States as to when they're going to call on some of their... Uh, extraterritorial obligations. So this is one, one example. For instance, the, um, the, the US is ordering Microsoft that is located in, in, um, in, in Ireland to hand over the email from an individual who I don't think is American, but uh, mm -hmm. the, that's a question mark. I think there was an anonymity issue. Um, because a company that is based in the United States, incorporated in the United States, should be able to hand over those data wherever the data is located. Mm -hmm. That's because the relationship that the U.S. has with Microsoft is basically an incorporation one. It's all, you know, it's... Um, and, of course, uh, Ireland and a large number of companies and the European Union is, is arguing, wait a minute, it's not... It's not because Microsoft is incorporated into the United States that they can hand over to you every single data that is, in fact, located in a data center in Ireland. There needs to be a little bit more, you know, it's got to be more complicated. The, the U.S. is probably, I haven't read the, the brief from the U.S., but I'm assuming that based on their longstanding um, approach, because the US, the, uh, Microsoft is a U.S. company, mm -hmm. is therefore within their jurisdictions, they should be able to claim uh, those data without having too many uh, hurdles being placed upon them. Now, when it comes to a European citizen who may have been affected by the metadata collection, um, 
the, the US is arguing that the, their obligation to protect the right to privacy does not extend to a European citizen with whom they don't have a, a direct relationship. It's, they are not on, in the US territory and they don't have any special relationship with America. 2014 was very important because uh, the United Nations issued yet another report, but fairly important, on uh, the right to privacy, and that included um, uh, an, an appreciation and a definition of what constitutes uh, extraterritorial obligation. And thus, it's participating to the process of continuing to build a, a global norm over what could become a very central issue around uh, protection of, of human rights. So um, what, what the report has argued, I'm just going to read, so um, that, does, that the human rights obligation of, the, of a state are engaged to, with respect to activities that involve the state's exercise of power or effective control over digital infrastructure and companies. So what is very interesting with this analysis is that they didn't focus so much on, on the individual. They didn't focus so much on where is the, the citizens or the individuals located. They focused instead of the relationship that these individuals may have with the United States through the um, basically all of those big infrastructures that are making internet a reality and the private companies that are also making internet um, a, global, a global thing. And I'm gonna quote here the um, NGO Privacy International that was very involved and that done a, a fairly thorough analysis of this report, uh, which uh, they have really said this, this is a game changer in, in, in terms of how extraterritorial obligations is being analyzed in a way that is really protecting the values at the heart of the human rights vision, but adapting those to the new environment. And it's an environment driven by private actors and driven by innovation and technology. Uh, and so, for instance, it gave an example. If a state has control over an undersea cable or over a company residing in its jurisdictions, it has, therefore, human rights obligations that are passing through mm -hmm. those cables or handled by that company. Uh, so that's one big thing. And then the other thing in terms, it's not a solution, but in terms of building up that enforcement mechanism, so at least the norm building mechanisms is uh, the fact that within uh, in a month's time, we should have a new um, UN mechanism on the protection of the right to privacy. It's a special rapporteur on the right to privacy who will be appointed in, in June at the Human Rights Council session. Terrific. Thank you for that update. That was a really good explanation. Carolina. Sure. Um, well, I want to bring another piece for this puzzle. I uh, do believe that we heard a little bit about this in the morning, but I want to just uh, go a little bit deeper to understand. But before of that, I would like all of us to actually give a step back and ask, what are we doing here? Right? I do believe that this morning was very clear, and actually with, from your expositions, that the sense of security, right, and Vincent also mentioned that, and the sense of trust is gone, right? Before Snowden, we had that. Uh, people that would complain would be called paranoid, and after that, uh, we have uh, actually lost clearly those senses. Mm -hmm. And I think that has a huge impact on this, on our sense as a global community, mm -hmm. uh, as the internet, as a media for the global community, and of course, in all the human rights we are mentioning here. So. The question for us here is like the challenge we have here nowadays is like what do we need moving forward to restore that? Do we need new norms? I'm, I'm sure we do need new norms. Do we need a new social contract? <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that's what actually one of the most important things we need, but people may say, oh, that's too abstract. That's actually not abstract. That social contract, that sense of community is what actually keep us together for not having a war every day, right? And what is the fundamental stone, the core element for all of that is transparency. 
And why do I say transparency? And I, I say transparency in the sense of access to information, access to knowledge, understanding what's going on in that ecosystem of internet governance that uh, Laura refers really well. And that allowed informed uh, citizens, right? Uh, uh, and empowered citizens to participate on internet governance and set this new social contract and rebuild the trust and the sense of security. So I think we are in a very, it, it's very, from a Brazilian living in the US, I think it's an incredible moment to see what happened in Ferguson and other areas because people are asking for this new social contract. People are asking for the reaffirmation of these core values and of these core sensations that we are talking here today, right? And a piece of that that's actually poisoning uh, the system or creating friction in the system is actually the lack of transparency on uh, regarding negotiations that do impact internet governance and that generate binding decisions like the trade agreements uh, that are not accessible to those populations involved. Uh, I, uh, in, I was in Busan for the ITU Plenipot and I told Sepulveda, which is the US ambassador, mm -hmm. said this is like bread and circles, right? Because the binding decisions are not being taken at WISIS, unfortunately, or if that's important, it builds an analytical framework for the space, it builds a narrative for the space, but the binding decisions is being taken uh, somewhere else. And it was very interesting to see a couple of weeks later a press release from the State Department saying, saying that it's through trade that we're going to secure the open internet. And I have never seen that coming from those actors that actually are the actors that are uh, leading a lot of the internet governance discussions. So why I bring trade? Nowadays I would love to invite you all to my office in DC and you're going to see on my wall <laughs> Every piece of trade agreement since 2004 to 2015, uh, 2014 pasted on my wall because I'm trying to map how uh, norms that impact on internet regulation are increasing qualitatively and quantitatively on trade agreements over the years. And it's very interesting for me to not say disappointing that a lot of people that are uh, core leaders on internet governance debate not paying attention to that. So you have information flow, you have uh, ISP liability, you have actually a lot of things that have impact on something dearly that we are talking nowadays, which is freedom of expression and privacy. Uh, one of the novelties on trade agreement now that reflects this increase, this quantitative and qualitative increase of regulation of internet through trade agreements is the fact that uh, national security may appear has an exception on the free flow of information clause. And this tells a lot. And the fact that free flow of information clauses are in the e-commerce chapter and not the overbroader chapter on the function of trade agreement also tells a lot. We which are talking, trade agreements are you referring to? Well, this is specifically I'm referring about the TPP. We don't have the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. We sure. don't have the text, but that's the word on the streets. But can you, I mean, there's been so much in transparency about those negotiations. Sure. How can you really, sure. I mean, I guess I'm a so little bit surprised because the idea that sort of freedom, internet freedom and human rights on the internet is going to be, is going to come through trade agreements. Sounds to me like a very surprising idea. So maybe I don't understand or maybe you could explain. Sure, so that's you know, why I was. To get information, yeah. That's mm -hmm. why, why I was talking earlier uh, about the need for the consolidation of what Laura was mentioning earlier mm -hmm. of the ecosystem and understand yeah. what are all the pieces of the ecosystem. They are not just the organizations and the actors that lead the ecosystems that Laura mapped really well, well in her last book, but they are actually the venues where those actors are exercising power. One of the venues besides UN, besides the ITU, it uh, are trade agreements, right? Since uh, 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 I'm, I'm starting mapping in 2004, uh, some trade agreements, so since the, uh, they are well, what are trade agreements, right? They are bilateral or multilateral international agreements that make international law and are binding to the countries. Of course, the countries have to approve them through a international, uh, internalization Congress process, and then they become law in general at the federal level. So that's what a trade it's agreement. It's not going too well in this country. 
Mm -hmm. like <laughs> well, we so there is a democratic process that plays an important role, I think. Yeah, know. exactly. And that's, that, that's one of the things I'm ta talking here, right? We need transparency to rebuild, going back to sure. my core message, security and trust, yeah. because the base of democratic systems is accountability, right? Mm -hmm. Is that information, right? And to build some of the norms uh, through secretive, uh, secretive negotiations can impact that. And I understand there are national security reasons, but what is the balance when Europe actually can share some of the documents on the TTIP, which is, the, it's, which is another trade agreement where Europe and the US is involved, and US do not. But uh, I don't want to enter too much on the transparency of the TPP per se, because that's not the point here. The point is really this bigger point of the core values for this social contract to restore security and trust. And freedom of expression is the core for all of that, yeah. right? If you don't trust, if you don't uh, reaffirm uh, uh, your right of freedom of expression and freedom of spe speech, you may not have justifications to even fight for access to these other documents and to these other venues. And it's really interesting, yesterday, Shu, which is the uh, House representative from California, she's House, right, not Senate. Uh, she just uh, uh, proposed a bipartisan bill on uh, the Free Speak Act. So it's really interesting to even see that nowadays we still need new bills and new laws to reinforce that right in US, which is the house of freedom of expression and things like that. And, and one of the things I do, a, a proposal that we have has uh, civil society and in, in a lot of coalitions we are part of is to actually develop something concrete. So it's a human rights assessment framework for trade agreements and other things that impact on freedom of expression, right? So we are building out of the Frank LaRue 2011 report to really extract what is some form of an index or something from there and to say, can you countries access when you're going to implement the trade agreements through, your, through uh, national legislation, how that going to impact in, normal, uh, in human rights, and specifically freedom of expression and privacy, and <laughs> then can we deal with it objectively? Because a lot of people think human rights is something that's extremely yeah. abstract. And actually, you have a lot of instruments of assessment. Assessment uh, was already made on environment issues, on climate issues, on works rights issues by the uh, UN Commission on Human Rights. So those mechanisms are in place and are very concrete. Um, and I think this is really important because if we lose, if, if, if US lost, but if he doesn't rebuild the, the, the power, the power narrative of the freedom, right? Who are we going to lean on to build? Uh, US, UK, and even Brazil, right? Uh, we need to really try to lead on this rebuilding this democracy and this, the, 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 and do not and, and if they don't accept real transparency and accountability, I think we're gonna all lose here, right? We will lose the argument pro a global internet, an open internet and an internet where free flow of information is one of the core values, right? We do need this, uh, this, this uh, strong democratic countries on the table and leading the debate uh, uh, and for them to conquest back this a, a, a position, they will have to put themselves open for accountability based on transparency. So I think it's, it's kind of a circular process yeah. uh, to give, be accountable, and then uh, rebuild hegemony so we can actually uh, uh, reinforce freedom of expression now and rebuild this trust and security. Oh, good. Well, that's a bit more optimistic than I was feeling when we started. Well, otherwise, this panel, we don't work so. in civil society, right? Oh, yeah. And Brazil, <laughs> we need to of be optimistic, vigilant, but optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific, Ben. Thanks very much. Uh, it's very always much. Uh, somewhat intimidating being a political scientist <laughs> on a panel with lawyers <laughs> and legislators. Uh, Absolutely. And the reason for that. <laughs> Uh, I wasn't. I wasn't going to say that, but um, uh, but um, and, and like most political scientists, I tend to think in a fairly simple-minded view of the world. So uh, you'll excuse me if uh, my comments sound a little simplistic. Uh, what is what is the problem that we're trying to wrap our heads around here? Well, certainly, one important dimension of that problem is that we live in a Westphalian system. And national laws, uh, when they're written to deal with issues of privacy in the digital age, 
uh, and throw that net out, um, leave a lot of fish swimming outside of the net. And the fish that are swimming outside of the net are uh, referred to uh, inelegantly as non-citizens. And, and so one of the, the real questions is how do you deal with the privacy rights of non-citizens? And that is an issue that has been not only floating through this uh, conversation, but it was also the subject of uh, 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 Brad Smith's presentation uh, uh, after lunch and uh, earlier this morning. Can you, besides being a fish, what is a non-citizen? A non-citizen is someone who is not afforded the same privacy rights sure, but as your own citizens. Mm -hmm. and so what NES is talking about then. Exactly, okay, and, and we've all been talking about it. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, how, how do you deal with that? How do, you, how do you level the playing field? How do you level the rights playing field so that everybody gets treated equally? Yeah. And the UN Special Rapporteur has been trying to do that by suggesting that all states should adhere to uh, a common set of norms or principles. Um, but it still begs the question, how do you operationalize it? Now, if you live in the European Union, you uh, have uh, European Union directives that tell you how you should deal with the rights of all European citizens, which is great for Europeans. Mm -hmm. It's not so great for non-Europeans. Yeah. Uh, if you live uh, in Canada, and uh, your information, 80% of .ca, uh, and .ca, by the way, is not California, it's Canada, it's the mm -hmm. Canadian domain name. 80% uh, of .ca domain names are stored on servers in the United States. So basically, if the NSA or anybody else wants to scrub through that data, they can, they can do it with abandon. Uh, if they want to look at your medical records, they can do it with abandon, without mm -hmm. the same due process provisions that Americans are afforded under the 1974 Privacy Act. So uh, Eric Jardine, who's over there in the third row, who's a, a postdoctoral fellow uh, with the Global Commission, uh, he and I have done a paper uh, under the title Equal Treatment and Digital Cross-Border Privacy Rights Protection which essentially argues that there's a well-established principle in trade law called the principle of equal uh, protection or equal treatment, which says that you will treat the goods of another country uh, the same way you would treat your own goods. You wouldn't put tariff barriers on them uh, if you're happy with the way those goods are produced without subsidies and the like. Mm. And what we're suggesting is that principle of equal treatment and it's basically the notion of reciprocity, uh, should be applied to non-citizens. Um, and, and where do you begin to apply that principle? Because different countries have different juridical regimes. Not all countries in the world are democracy. It's particularly important when it comes to law enforcement and intelligence gathering. And we've suggested in this paper that you might start with the five eyes. Uh, and the five eyes, in case you don't know, uh, are the, are the Anglo-Saxon countries that have uh, special arrangements going back to the first, uh, second world war, I should say, uh, to, uh, to share intelligence openly mm -hmm. and equally. And uh, you could start with the five eyes to uh, uh, afford the, uh, the equal treatment principle when it comes to the citizens of their respective countries. Now that's going to make a lot of Europeans unhappy. Um, and what I would suggest is that you needn't make this a closed club. It should, in fact, be an open club. And ideally, the countries who are members of the Freedom Online Forum uh, could uh, uh, subscribe to this principle. It, it's actually, I think, if you think it through, it's a way to raise the bar, exactly. it's not to lower it, because you would not extend reciprocity to a country that does not have effective due process yeah. uh, when it comes to the application of privacy and digital rights. So it's an incentive if you want, if you want your citizens to be treated 
like the citizens, let's say, of the United States, which has fairly high standards, uh, in fact, very high standards when it comes to privacy. Um, they could be higher. We can all agree on that. But they're higher than most. Um, you're going to have to clean up your own act uh, if you want to be part of the club. Um, when we've run this idea by some of our friends uh, in the intelligence community, we get a lot of skepticism. Um, but um, some uh, s have said that uh, certainly when it, when it comes to uh, equal treatment, um, you know, they're different categories. Uh, so it's a principle that could be applied to the collection, retention, and use of data. That doesn't cover everything, but at least it's a way to start and it's a way to operationalize some of these UN principles. You know, you can continue to float at the level of norms, but at some point, those norms have to hit the ground operationally in a Westphalian system, and that good old-fashioned principle of reciprocity is one way to do it. So, Fen, it's a, a great idea, but I have a question. I thought one of the many things that we learned from Snowden was that the opposite is happening, mm -hmm. that the way things are working now, the British spy on the Americans, the American spy on the Brits, and we share it with each other. So why would people want to lose that backdoor way of sp getting data on your own citizens? Uh, you have to look at it from the point of view of citizens. Yes. Right? So we'd have, we need and a lot of citizens to get this to happen. If you're an right? American citizen, mm. do you want the American government going to the Canadian uh, Security Intelligence Agency, which has perhaps computers that aren't quite as good as NSA, but pretty yeah. comparable data gathering activities to, in effect, gather information on your own citizens. And I would say, you know, in the Five Eyes context, uh, one would argue that um, from a citizen standpoint, if we're talking about restoring trust, mm -hmm. uh, that the fact that you're a non-citizen but you're going to get equal treatment would provide some measure of reassurance. Yeah. This doesn't mean that intelligence and, and law enforcement officials aren't going to be in the business of gathering data, mm -hmm. but you want, to have, you want to afford your citizens and your non-citizens of like-minded democracies the same due process provisions that other citizens have. And, and, and the principle of reciprocity doesn't mean that the law enforcement and due process mechanisms work the same way, right? It, it recognizes difference, but it's, it says there's essential equivalence here in terms of your due process mechanisms, and we're sufficiently comfortable with it. And it's presumably if it started with the five eyes, then it could spread to the EU next, right? Absolutely. And then the idea is you Absolutely. build Absolutely. Good. It's I was a wondering, snowball. Yeah, that's, that's what it sounds like. I wanted to ask, Jen, yes, what you made of that. But, Marietje, you look like you wanted to weigh well, in here, I mean, so please do. Because we, uh, we've heard a lot more now. I guess um, what, I, what I think is a real missed opportunity in all of this that we mm. can learn from this is you know, imagine the scenario where across U.S. government board, because, you know, we have to recognize that what intelligence services do may not be uh, helpful to the foreign policy or the commercial interests or um, uh, even the strategic interests in the end. So it's also important that departments talk to each other. But what if the United States, to start here, with its powerful tech community, with its strong First Amendments and Bill, Amendments and Bill of Rights, with its uh, global position of power, would have identified this position of power as a huge opportunity, not only to look at a minimal issue like reciprocity for allied country citizens, for example, but to horizontally reach out to people who are stuck in countries under authoritarian governments with a lack of, of human rights uh, and who look to the open societies of this world, increasingly to Europe, uh, but uh, also to the US, for a connection and a recognition of those rights. Uh, I think what, what has really been a missed opportunity and what I hope uh, will be picked up now and I hope the EU can take a lead in is to see this as a soft power opportunity and as a way to advance people's human rights. I mean, yes, we have to identify the threats to, to human rights, but by and large, the emergence of new technologies has offered tremendous opportunities for access to information, for freedom of speech, etc. And so I hope that in the EU, 
uh, there will be the vision, which unfortunately uh, often is, is too uh, restricted, but a, a grand vision that a strong European single market with strong protection of civil rights and uh, fundamental freedoms is not only a competitive advantage, because you know those can be extraterritorially ap applied just the same, and I see market demand going in that direction. So I think there will be a huge advantage of strong protections, but it should also be seen as an opportunity to um, play a role of meaning as a democracy when it comes to human rights of people across the world. And yeah, well, I think it's clear we're all really hopeful about the EU and what they can do, as well as Brazil. <laughs> Um, I want to call on Rebecca McKinnon, but I can see I all the panelists want to say something. So let's and, and I the think panelists and then put Rebecca in the hot seat. Yes. And I think that what she said actually takes exactly to one of the core points I was making. And she, and she was known, and, and nowadays I think a lot of you know, the State Department do finance a lot of civil society everywhere in the world mm -hmm. on these less democratic countries and also on democratic countries, including in Brazil. Right? Why they finance these folks to actually fight for a better human rights framework everywhere, including on their countries, but also to actually to act globally. At the moment that the Snowden uh, revelations comes and you lose that legitimacy, people say, oh wait, are you saying this publicly, but yeah. are you doing that uh, yeah. privately? So, those folks cannot accept any more financing from the State Department and even some philanthropic foundations from the US because they're going to say you are helping surveillance in our countries. So if we don't re reinforce the need of accountability, better processes, reform of privacy laws in the US, uh, application cross-border, I, uh, I am a citizen for that, for that application because I have a, a green card here. But a lot of people that come, go and come back are students. You guys are not, uh, you are non-citizens here for, for while you are here. So if you don't have that protection, right, and you, if, if we cannot exercise this accountability towards what's happening, U.S. will not restore that ability to actually solidify freedom of expression in-house and outside. Right, well said. Should we do Agnes and then Fan and then Rebecca? Does that sound good? Okay, yep. great. <clears throat> I was um, gonna um, in, in, um, bring in uh, a fact, mm -hmm. factor that we haven't mentioned so far, but I think it's certainly mm -hmm. the um, defining element of our decade, which is uh, national security and uh, uh, terrorism and anti-terrorism. I think the, the, um, the suggestion that you've offered or, um, and, and, and indeed the, the principle that you've put forward are all very well taken and, and in a better world, I think we would have had some greater chances to, uh, to see them moving forward. I, uh, based on my own work and my own research, I will say that at the moment, the, um, the narrative around national security and the imperative of counterterrorism have infiltrated every aspect of our life, whether it's economic, whether it's political, or whether it's social. And certainly, as far as technology is concerned, I think this is absolutely the driving force at the moment as far as um, the policies on internet regulation and, and so forth. Uh, so the um, the, the, the hope that we, we are, that, that right now the environment may be conducive to um, some of those bigger uh, values and principles, I think, uh, I, I don't have that hope. I, I see that far more as a 20 years process uh, and not, uh, definitely not right now as, uh, as something that we will be, uh, will be able to achieve. I'm totally with you in the pessimist camp. In fact, our students just finished doing a capstone for access, and the trend that they saw all over the world was more and increased oh, yeah. surveillance laws yeah. everywhere, yeah. partly with using terrorism, and even Charlie Hebdo is a justification. It's so I'm definitely in the, in the depressed camp. Fen, cheer us up, please. Okay. <laughs> well, I think you know, one, one uh, point of, uh, of hope uh, lies in the recommendations of the Podesta Commission. Mm -hmm. um, which, when it came to uh, uh, the extension of the Privacy Act of 74 to non-U.S. persons, 
uh, stated, quote, where practicable, it, they should be extended, those provisions should be extended where practicable, or to uh, establish alternative privacy policies that apply appropriate and meaningful protections. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's encouraging, even if it were to be an executive order under a new administration, I think it's not, doesn't have the same force as law, but as we've learned in the United States, uh, it's, a, it's a good substitute um, in, in some cases. Um, the more general point I would make is, you know, before we preach privacy to uh, Chinese and Russians, mm. uh, Western democracies have to raise the bar for themselves. And, and, you know, a good place to begin, perhaps, is how they treat the privacy rights of citizens of other democracies. Uh, to me, um, that's, that's a no-brainer. Uh, but then, as I said, I'm a simple-minded political scientist and not a sophisticated lawyer or legislator. Well, I was actually in a meeting yesterday with a tech titan who's not American, who sort of laughed at all the Americans at the meeting and said, you, you're worse off than China, in fact, because not only do you have government surveillance, you have Amazon and Google who know everything about you and they share it with the government. And the Chinese government may be doing a lot of surveilling, but the Chinese companies well, aren't. So wow. he was very clear. Oh. I know, so I'm <laughs> such a bummer. Rebecca, <laughs> any solutions, any policies? That's not yeah. really. Alibaba, China, Mobile, they do no surveillance. <laughs> okay, let's hear from you. Yeah, right. Thank well, you. and in many cases, the consequences are very different. I mean, I think yeah. we have, we That's have what to the be Americans very critical all said. of ourselves. Exactly. No, we have yeah. to be very critical of ourselves. Yeah, That's exactly. what everyone, yeah. The, that's what everyone else at the meeting exactly. said. Exactly, I think. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay, Rebecca, some policy suggestions well, and solutions? I, I didn't have my hand up, so I was, that's thinking, I was thinking in the next I know. Panel, so Maybe we can get a preview. I was saving oh, sorry. my sort of things about preparing for that. Yeah. Um, since Ben mentioned the Freedom Online Coalition, which is a very you know, you have what are now 26 governments, uh -huh. the United States, originally sort of led by Hillary Clinton and our internet freedom policy, Sweden, and you know, Estonia, of, you, know, you know, Estonia, lots of democratic governments making commitments to a free and open internet. And they won't make commitments about transparency around surveillance. You know, they issued a declaration last year in Tallinn with a bunch of commitments. None of no, the governments no, have shown any concrete efforts in any kind of meaningful way to meet these commitments, to be more transparent. You know, I mean, yeah, we've got some legislation around the edges and so on, but in, in terms of real commitment to lead the way uh, for how you respect rights online, at least amongst democracies, you know, internet freedom starts at home, they're not doing much. Um, and there, I, I think that, that we need to see a more concerted effort amongst the world's leading democracies and the democratic governments who claim that to be champions of internet freedom because, as several of you were just saying, internet freedom is on decline around the world. If you look at Freedom so, House it's hard. Uh, reports, yeah, if, I have if the data here. at kind of the statistics of a number of organizations that are measuring this, that are tracking laws, yeah, 36 right. had declined exactly. from 2013 to 2014, yeah. Greater, greater, you know, more government intrusion on user data with less, you know, less protections. More people more dying. More <laughs> for intermediaries, more power of the government to get you know, companies to take down the content. So that is the global trend. Yeah. Um, oh. And the, the world's leading democracies are not doing much to staunch that trend. So um, we have we have a problem of, of you know if if we want to have the kind of internet we claim we want we're not leading by example. Yeah, thank you. I, I say, I say that, like are to, we... So we just have five minutes, okay. and part of why I get chosen to be a moderator is because I'm very tough. So um, I also want to point out, anybody standing, we have seats in the front, so ignore the reserve sign, and then, yeah, let's take a couple comments from the audience or questions. Yes, go ahead. Lovely, thank you. 
I'm Mike Nelson with Cloudflare, and I'm also speaking in the next panel. But I wanted to ask a question about cybersecurity, since that's part of the title for the overall conference. The human rights community has done a lot over the last 10 years to advance the use of encryption to protect what dissidents have to say. But there's another aspect of cybersecurity where the human rights community hasn't done quite as well, and that is in protecting themselves against hacker attacks. We now have this growing number of hacktivists often self-righteously deciding that they need to shut up somebody. Um, we also have this terrible phenomenon of trolls who just think it's fun to issue de uh, death threats and rape threats against people who are outspoken. I'm curious if any of the panelists have ideas on how we can help ensure that the best technology is available to people to protect their freedom of speech so that we don't have governments, hacktivists, just mean nasty people using hacker tools to shut people up. Yeah. Did you also ask as well? Or did you I, I personally don't think the solution is technological. Why? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody who believes that at the moment the gap between policies and technology is so, gap, is so large that um, partly it's why uh, we're confronting some of those problems with policymakers running after technology, uh, breathless, uh, and not catching up. So to me, the problem is not new technology to protect. It's a better policies and better accountability, both regional, national, and international, to tackle some of those problems. And I will say that as far as the um, hackers attack and the trolls are concerned, most countries have very you know, straightforward laws on harassment and, and, and bullying that should be, at least with the trolls, that should that should apply. But it's not working. Well, so, they, they, they are working in, in a number her. of, of uh, <laughs> circumstances. Where, where the victims go to court, it's working. Now, is it catching up with you know, the, 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 the number of trolls? And, and the, uh, that's a different question. And do we need different administrative mechanisms to, to handle it? That's something that is possible. But I just don't. I, I, I just don't believe that the response got to be technological. I totally that is agree not with that, within yes, uh, I want to slightly right? disagree because I think we need to tackle the problem at short term, term mid term, and long term. At short term, term, people actually do need to learn to protect themselves. And people are dying because of it. Uh, bank accounts are being swiped clean. I had a friend in the Middle East that that happened, so she couldn't travel for a while. Uh, journalists are getting killed because they people and sources are getting killed. So people do need to learn, and for that, uh, there are a bunch of workshops run by civil society in Latin America, for example, exactly trying to train that. And there is a bunch of people doing capacity sure. building around that. In in long term, then I agree with you, we need that change. But for that change to happen in both ways, we need to unite human rights, lawyers, political science, cybersecurity experts, and build a curricula that's holistic enough to address that issue. It's not like OSF running all over Latin America teaching militaries to do how militaries do things do. No, we need more people at that day. We need a multi-stakeholder curricula to ensure to tackle this problem at short term and long term. Great. So we, I'm sorry to say we have one minute left, speaking of freedom of speech. Uh, so I'm going to give that minute to Fen, I suppose. Yeah. Sure. If you're looking for some uh, more good news, yeah. um, uh, Eric Jardine has uh, done a terrific paper uh, uh, empirical paper which shows that if you look at attacks of all varieties and kinds mm -hmm. online, when adjusted for uh, the number of internet users, it's actually in decline. Good. And that's right across the board. Eric, am I putting words in your mouth or is that more or less correct? When adjusted for the growing size of the internet, it's only the better situation that we get when we just look at the number. Absolute okay. numbers, yeah. But the, uh, in many instances, yes. Yeah. Which suggests that people are getting smarter, that the technology is getting better, and that maybe there's less in it for those who are doing it. Good. So on that note, I think this is a wonderful sort of preview of your next panel that we'll all be going to. So I'd like to thank the panelists and the audience. This is uh, terrific. Very much. Good.